Hey everyone, Mike Sattel here to answer some very common SAT questions, specifically how does the SAT scoring system work? And a kind of compliment to that question that I get asked quite a bit is what is each SAT question worth? This one's a little bit more uh, difficult to answer, but I think I can give you a very basic kind of summary that's gonna help you in most cases. So let's get right into it, starting with the overall scoring system for the SAT. Hopefully this is already familiar to you. The SAT has two subjects, reading and writing is one, math is the other, and those are on a scale from 200 to 800 per subject. Why doesn't it start at zero? I don't know, that's just the way it goes. The total score then is found by adding those two subjects together, so the overall SAT is on a scale from 400 to 1600. To put things in perspective, an average score on any subject is about a 500, and so the average on the overall SAT is about a 1,000. But if you're curious where your scores kind of put you in the grand scheme of things, my advice is to look at one of the charts that has the SAT user percentiles. I will put a link to one of those in the description. That can give you a sense of kind of like what percent of people you're doing better than. So it's a good way to kind of get that perspective. But let's get to our main event. What is each question worth? Well, my estimate is that it's roughly 10 or 20 points per question. This is the estimate I use with my students. It's really helpful for thinking about where you are and where you, what you need to do to get where you wanna go. So let's talk an example of that, right? Let's say you have a 650 in one subject. That's a pretty good score. But let's say you want a great score. You wanna boost that to 700. What would it take? Well, that's a difference of about 50 points. So using this estimate, conservatively, it's probably about five more questions that you need to get right to get to that 700 level. And it could be more like four or three because of the 10 or 20 point thing, but five is gonna pretty much guarantee you get there, maybe there and then some. And then of course, if you wanna get all the way to 800, what would that take? Why are you at a 700 anyway? Probably because you're getting around 10 questions wrong in that particular subject. Again, it might be seven or eight instead, but this is a great estimate to help you understand where you are and what it would take to improve the score the way you wanna improve it. But I do want to stress, okay, this is an estimate only. The actual scoring system is much more complicated. Uh, it doesn't really affect us in any practical way. But if you are curious, I am going to make another video about the twists involved in the SAT scoring system. I will link to that in the description as well. But I promise you, it is not containing any sort of secret strategy or anything. Everything you need is in here. The only reason to watch that other video is just to satisfy your own curiosity. But to give you a sense of why this is just an estimate, um, there's two basic things that are kind of making it harder to understand definitively what's going on with our scores. One is that there is variability from question to question. Now you might've said, yeah, no duh, Mike, you said some are worth 10, some are worth 20. Well, that's an oversimplification. There isn't like a list of the 10 point questions versus the 20 point questions. And if we just identify the 20 point ones, we can then maximize our score. It doesn't work that way. It's not like any particular question is worth a set number of points on this scale. There's a lot of stuff going on in the back end. There's different difficulty levels and different points that are going on in a way that we'll never know. The, co the College Board has not released this information. So the best we can do is guess, but it does mean that if you took a practice test twice, the same practice test and you got let's say five questions wrong let's say you got numbers one through five wrong in one section the first time you took it then the second time you took it you got those questions right and got six to ten wrong so another five questions I would bet that you would have different scores on those two exams, even though it's the same practice test and it's the same number wrong, there's variability in the questions, so you might have just gotten slightly different scores. Maybe one you get a 750, one you get a 730. That's nothing to worry about, it doesn't matter, it's still roughly the same, and that 10 or 20 point estimate still works. There's also variability from test to test, what a lot of people call the SAT curve, but I wanna stress, there is no easy SAT. A lot of people think that if they take the SAT at a certain time of year, they're gonna get an easier test, they're gonna get a harder test. Those are all lies, it doesn't matter. The SAT definitely does have slightly easier exams occasionally, slightly harder exams, but what the scaling system is doing is it's evening that out. So when we talk about a curve on the SAT, 
it's not like it's adjusted based on how students do. It is purely adjusted so that a 700 on one exam is equivalent in skill level to a 700 on another exam. So if there is an easier SAT, it's not going to benefit you in any way. It's going to even out with what they we call the curve, the way that the scoring system changes. Again, I'll talk more about this in the other video if you're curious, but it doesn't matter for any practical purposes. If you are trying to understand your scoring, stick to this estimate. It's about 10 or 20 points per question with one big exception. So let's talk about adaptive testing. This is also part of the digital SAT experience. Now, the quick version is we have one module or two modules per subject. The first module for each one, the first section, is going to be an average difficulty of questions, so a mixture of easy, medium, and hard. If you do well in that module, you get placed in a second module that is noticeably harder. If you do not do so well in the first module, you will get placed in an easier second module. And the biggest difference, yes, is the difficulty of the questions, but also the scoring of these two modules. If you get placed in the hard module, you still have a chance at a perfect 800. If you get placed in the easy module, you're basically limited to a 600, maybe 610, maybe 620, it's an estimate, but you are not getting a 700 if you get placed in that easy module. So we do not want to be placed in the easy module if we want a top score. And so with these adaptive testing rules, weird things can happen. So let's look at an example. We could have two students who both get 10 questions wrong, but get very, very different scores. So let me walk you through how this might work, starting with the 680 student on the left. They would probably do very well in the first module. Maybe they only get one question wrong there. So that's great. They're definitely gonna get placed in the harder second module. But because it's harder, they're gonna get harder questions and they're gonna get more wrong. So let's say they get nine questions wrong in that second module. That's still pretty good, but that's 10 questions overall. Using our estimate of 10 to 20 points a question, I would guess that they're probably gonna get something like a 680 on the test overall. So that makes sense with our estimate. For the other student, they got a 550 and they also got 10 questions wrong. So what gives, why is that possible? They probably did worse in the first module. Let's say they got nine questions wrong. And I talk about this in other videos, but if you want to stay out of that easy module, you really can't get more than five questions wrong. So if you get more than five questions wrong, you're increasing the odds they put you in that easy module and nine questions wrong, no doubt you're getting put in that easy module and that's going to limit your score. Now you're going to get easier questions, so maybe this student only gets one question wrong in that easier module, which is good, but the damage is already done. They still only got 10 questions wrong, but because their score was limited kind of from the start, once they got into that easy module, they never really had a chance of getting above a 600. And so the way to think of it is it's still roughly 10 or 20 points a question. For example, if they got this one question right, I would bet that it would boost their score to like a 560 or a 570, so 10 or 20 points. But it's kind of like if they started off at a 650. So it's kind of like, you know, when we do the subtraction of the 10 questions, if you're in the hard module, we're subtracting from 800. If we're in the easy module, you're better off thinking of it as like subtracting from 650. And so that's kind of where the 100 points gets lost. But this gets even more complicated if, this, if someone is on the cusp and they're you know, just getting into that easy module and maybe if they get just a few more right, they're gonna be placed in the hard one, you might see the score kind of stay, you know, jump a little bit, but also you might see the number wrong change dramatically. For example, if this student here on the right got five more questions right in the first module, then they'd probably get placed in the hard second module. But because they're a 550, 600 level student, they're gonna get a lot wrong. So they might go from 10 wrong or five wrong to all the way to like 20 or more than that wrong. So that hard module is gonna be rough on them. So it's gonna feel like they got more questions wrong, but they were harder questions. And so the score is kind of gonna jump to what it was on the left where it's still roughly 10 or 20 points per question. But if you are noticing that as you take your practice tests, the number wrong is fluctuating quite a lot and your score isn't really, that might be why. You're probably on the borderline between the easy and hard module and it really does kind of affect how many you get wrong based on which module you're in. But honestly, this is way more complicated than it needs to be. You don't really need to think about this because the strategies that we're gonna use are very, very straightforward. There's just two. Number one, get as many questions right as possible. And number two, don't leave any questions blank. And that first one might seem obvious, but you'd be surprised. One of the most common questions I get asked is, should I do the hard questions first? Because the hard questions are worth more and I wanna get more points. 
Well, first of all, we don't know if they're worth more. So I've done some experiments on that. Again, I'll put the link in the description if you're curious. But regardless, they're not worth that much more, even if they are worth more. One hard question might take you five minutes to answer. That's a long time since each section is only about a half hour. In that five minutes, you might have been able to get five of the easy and medium questions right. So I don't care how much more, how many more points this one is worth. Maybe it's only 20, but it's definitely not worth the 50 or more that these easy and medium ones are, are worth. So if you're trying to maximize your score, it, it's as simple as just get as many questions right as possible. If something is hard, don't worry about it as much. Just get as many right as possible in the time limit. That will boost your score the most. And one way we can make sure we maybe get a little extra boost at the end is if you are running out of time or you don't know the answers to some questions, don't leave them blank. Put an, uh, put an answer of some kind. So the SAT treats wrong answers the same as blank answers. So a blank answer doesn't get you anything. A wrong answer doesn't get you anything. But at least with a wrong answer, we have a chance, if it's a random guess, of guessing right, right? If we leave it blank, we have a 0% chance of getting that question right. If we pick a random letter, we at least have a 25% chance on most questions of happening to get some points and being lucky. And we'll take that. That's very good. So people also talk about rumors that there's a guessing penalty on the SAT. There is no guessing penalty. I talk more about that in the other video if you're curious, but there is no guessing penalty. Answer every single question. Put something, even those free response math ones, put a number down. Just take a wild guess. You never know. But also, as you're pacing yourself through the sections, try to get as many questions right as possible. Target the easy ones because they're going to be faster. And I do have pacing videos that go into more detail about how we can identify where the easy questions are. But for now, that's it. Again, I do have that twist video with more detail, but it is not holding back on any strategies. Everything that you need to know is here. I'm not going to add any new information strategically. So this is going to be enough for most people. Just make sure that you are following those two strategies and you should do fine. Of course, though, there are way more strategies that we need for the SAT for all the different topics in reading and math. So make sure you subscribe to my channel to have easy access to that. And at the least, if this video was helpful, subscribing just helps me out and is a great way of saying thank you. It's easy and free. So once again, I'm Mike Sattel. And remember, when it comes to your scores, don't settle for less. Sattel for more. Thanks for watching.